Welcome back to Rubrics, a podcast from St. Timothy's Episcopal Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Father Steve, it's good to be back with you after a hiatus. We say this every time now. We're busy. We get to this when we can, um, but it's good to finally have a chance to sit down on this uh, feast day of uh, a name which is always a game to pronounce. Samuel Isaac Joseph Sherachewski. Sherachewski? I say Sherachewski. Sheriff Shusky, there we go. <clears throat> um, but we're we're gonna uh, tackle a couple different topics today. Um, but I do not have the collect for uh, Samuel Isaac and Joseph today, so I'm going to open with the collect from this past Sunday to open our time together. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that that Thy grace may always proceed and follow us, and make us continually to be given to all good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, Father Steve, to open our time, I think we're going to banter a little bit about something you put in the parish email uh, that caused um, some reaction, good reaction, but um, you know, you sent something uh, to the parish a couple of weeks ago that we um, jokingly referred to as your gladiator speech. Are you not entertained? But why don't you why don't you talk a little bit about that and kind of what's been on our mind with regards to uh, ministry here at St. Timothy's, but just broadly speaking. Yeah, the the what I put in there was um, it's been what three weeks now, I mm-hmm. think is, and I think I think people took it as an unintended critique uh, which right. which is which was not which was not the in, the intention it has generated some conversation which is very good including today i got um a continued uh, response of a con- of a conversation that has started since it came out i i was sort of thinking out loud and wondering and i don't think this is an this is a question that that we're asking only at st timothy's this is an existential christian question but i just contextualized it in this parish. And that is if you were to list the things that you would want a church to do. And I think after the experience of the pandemic, we really, because we had a clean slate in every sense of the word, we wanted to build our community and, and set our priorities on the things that truly mattered as, as, as what it means to be a church and to, and to form and develop and nurture Christians in the faith. And so the things that were superfluous were now are now gone, at least in our discernment. And the things that truly matter, we're trying to make sure they are front and center. So what would you want in a church? I would say that if you were to take the community engagement aspect, the so-called outreach part, okay, we've got a homeless shelter that we've done for 10 years the our partners have have changed their focus a bit so but we want to continue our focus on on having an overnight shelter so we now are an independent working on a nonprofit status for that shelter so we're doing that a bold move we have uh, an, a a bold ministry that's now its own nonprofit the society of saint joseph of arimathea which is an extraordinary outreach where we're now uh, about to partner officially with one of the larger hospital networks, not only in North Carolina, but in, 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 um, in the region. So we're doing that. We, we, of course, people we know about, about our outreach with law enforcement, you know, the continued witness with that. And not only that, those are the things that happen here, but our, um, engagement with what it means to be a Christian in the world has spurred all, spurred all sorts of, uh, individual acts, which is what we want for people to do various things in their community. So we got that going on. All right. What else do we have? Well, we have, um, worship. Obviously that's, you know, we were, you and I were sending screenshots back and forth. We asked chat GPT, tell me something about St. Timothy's and Winston Salem and, and shockingly a, f- a very fair it's, it's summary yeah. of, uh, yeah. of, of the church. Until it and wasn't. Until it wasn't, but but yeah. um, but for the most part, really surprised me. A that it knew who we were and had mm-hmm. enough information to to reflect on it. So um, obviously, we, we we know that we have uh, mass every single day of the week. We have morning prayer um, and evening prayer Sunday through Thursday. Um, church is open. We have, I mean, all the things you could want liturgically. Mm-hmm. We we've made a priority. Um, good music, 
a priority formation. And we we're always trying to find ways to, to deepen that and to, and to have engagement with that at all levels. Um, and we're always pivoting and we're never married to any one thing. We sort of adapt to what the needs are. You have that pastoral care. We continue to develop where we have a team that visits our shut-ins every single month. And now you and I are on this new schedule of making sure that we, you and I rotate and making sure that people have communion every single month if they, if they can't, can't be here and they desire it. Um, you know, again, uh, all the things you would want, fellowship engagements, you know, we have. Um, so the, the, the question would be, if we have all of that, um, one would suspect there would be a concomitant energy that comes with that comes with that. And the sort of the thinking out loud was, it just doesn't feel, and I think objectively we can measure not a, a lot of, of 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 discernible energy that that and I and defined energy as as translating into increased attendance in worship. Attendance is more than it was the previous year, but increased attendance, frequent attendance, and also the engagement with people to come and join us in worship. And I think so. I think what 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 um, where I missed on that was I didn't. I didn't um, specifically, explicitly say I'm not. I'm not conflating activity with energy, and that was one of the one of the, the main things that I think people read that I didn't mean to say. Is I'm not saying that we're not doing enough. Actually, I'm saying quite the opposite. We're yeah. doing all we're kinds doing of so things. Much. We're doing all kinds of things as a community and individuals on their own, as it should be, are doing all kinds of amazing things. It's just that. On Sunday morning, is there uh, is there a discernible, palpable energy and joy about being a Christian, and about being a Christian in in a community? And again, I don't think in talking to my colleagues and in the, actually, there are also um, clergy who read our weekly email as we read other churches' emails. This is what we do. They sort of sent me an amen response, you know, feeling the same thing. So. So the question was, is to, the, what the intent was to get us to think about what does it mean to be excited and energized about being a Christian? And I, and I wanted to say, I'm not looking for people to be jazzed about our brand. Like, I, I don't want to sell T-shirts that say, I love my church. Right. I'd much rather have T-shirts that say, I love the church. Yeah. And then I find, I find the fullness of that in my, in my local parish. I'm not trying to, you know, have a sort of proprietary kind of provincial, uh, parochial um, loyalty, but just as followers of Jesus Christ, what is, how does that energize my life? And mm -hmm. the, um, this came from a conversation we had in, in a vestry meeting. It was a spontaneous conversation. But I, I made the comment that there was this new restaurant that was opening up. I forget the name of it, but I knew yeah. about it, and everyone else knew about it. You've been? I haven't been, yeah, and but but I made the you know I, I mentioned this restaurant that was in town, and most of the vestry said, "Yeah, I've heard about that." I said, "Here's interesting. Do you know how you know about it? It's because people are talking about it. Yeah, they're interested in it, and that's simply how it works. Is that if if it matters to us, and if we're interested, and if it makes a difference, then evangelism, communicating the faith, should be natural." And I think that, and one of the things, one of the conversations I'd like us to have is thinking about what authentic evangelism should be. And it doesn't have to be a program, although there, I'm sure there are sort of tips and tools that are helpful. It needs to be natural. Right. If something matters to you, if it's important to you, it, it automatically finds a way to be communicated through your life. I mean, you can think of any number of of examples of places you like to go, food you like to eat, sports teams you support, what your children are doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to force it. It's just there. So that was the point. And the, and the are you entertained um, um, reference comes from a, a, a presentation that I heard uh, by a priest named Justin Lewis Anthony, Church of England priest, who wrote a book. And he came to a clergy conference years and years ago. He wrote a book called... Um, if you see George Herbert on the street, kill him. And it's a, it's supposed to grab your attention, and he doesn't yeah. mean that. George Herbert was this 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 sort of uh, idyllic uh, country parson who mm -hmm. 
who loved his people and wrote poetry and hymns and did all that. And what, what um, Justin Lewis Anthony was saying is that kind of ruined the model of what, of what the parish priest is because people assume you just, you just sit there and write hymns and poetry and whatever. But he showed a video of, uh, of, of Russell Crowe and the gladiators, Maximus, yeah. after being in the arena and killing all these people. And then the crowd was silent. And he said to the crowd, you know, are you not entertained? And his point was is that sometimes parish clergy uh, feel like that if they do all the things that they're asked to do and there's no response and not, not praise of the priest, but engagement of the faith right. and in the parish, I mean, what, what, do, what, do, we, what, what do you want? Uh, and again, I want to be clear, it's not about us, it's not about you and me, it's not about our praise or our validation, or our vocation. We should find that in, in the ministry itself and in the sacraments and all that. It's just in growing a community to be vulnerable and raw and honest on this podcast, when you want to grow a community and we're centered on the essentials of faith, there there should be um, there should be some evidence of that. We call that we call those fruits. Right. Jesus Christ yeah. speaks about it a lot. Saint Paul speaks about it, and it's not a critique of this community at all. It's not a critique. Right. It's an observation of of the reality of being a Christian, and maybe in this sort of depressed malaise of the religious landscape that we're in now in this time, in in our existence, you know be it post-COVID or whether that's even a, a relevant um, variable, I don't know. So it was just sort of thinking out loud. And we try to be completely honest and, and, and always transparent about what's on our mind, what our mm-hmm. concerns are, what we're, what, we're, what we're struggling with or wondering with. And so uh, that, was, that was one of the, one of the things that I wanted to um, express in that parish email. Yeah, I think, I think it's getting to uh, a question or a conversation about whether or not you you trust in the work of the spirit i mean at least that's that's what i'm sensing within myself that you know we're we're saying our prayers we're seeking to glorify god in everything we do we are responsive to the needs in our community in the way that we're equipped to be you know, our overflow shelter and soja and other things do we trust that the spirit is going to work through this um and that's that's uh, as much of a challenge to me as it is just a question i'm posing out here um but I think at times we need to kind of ask ourselves that of uh, do we trust for the spirit to work or do I think I need to supplement with X, Y, or Z to get the response I'm hoping for? Um, and that's that's a challenge that uh, priests have to work through, of leaders of, of congregations and of people in their own lives too. I mean, how many times do people say, I said my prayer, but I didn't get anything out of it. And yeah. so what else should I be doing? And, and you know, our response to them is you got to keep at it. I mean, this is a a slow fire that is building to a roaring bonfire. It's not a big gasoline flame that's going to be gone next week. I mean, we're trying to stoke it little by little um, so that it's, you know, or even if it's like a candle that stays burning, um, no matter the circumstances, it's a small flame that you carry with you that is always ignited and not some roaring bonfire that's gone the next day. Um, But it's a similar idea. Do you trust the spirit to work? in his own time, not necessarily according to the timeline I want. I mean, here's a good example. I told the vestry, I'm going to start praying for more people. I've been praying for more people. It's not like our doors are breaking down the last three weeks. Um, And, you know, in my own timeline, I'm like, gosh, you know, it's been three weeks. Uh, What's going on? And it's, it's again, uh, that reminder to to trust in in the Spirit's timing and trust that the Spirit is working um, in a way that I have no concept of. Um, yeah, I mean, I was thinking when you were saying that. I mean, the image that comes to this is a strange image, but but I think of a sort of a, a flint um, flint rifle, where if you see an image of it when they when they fire and it makes the spark, yeah. there is the initial there's the firing, and then there's about a two or three second pause before the projectile actually comes out. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, I think I think in situations like this as clergy is that we have to. We have to remind ourselves that we are being formed and and mm-hmm. and learning patience uh, in the sense that while things may not happen on our time, we trust that they still will happen in God's time. And I think the thing we have to we have to um, um, you still with me, Father Luke? I am. You with me? Okay. Uh, Did I cut the out screen, for a second? The, well, the screen said reconnecting. I don't know if that was an existential statement yeah, or yeah, if it was yeah. a technological thing, but. 
Um, but the thing, the thing that we probably should say against um, explicitly is that when we talk about what we're praying for, is that we're trusting that we're praying for the very things that God wants for us as well. Right. Is that our will is in conformity with His will. So, mm-hmm. our prayer in that sense is we we want we want Christians to be alive in the faith. We want yeah. Christians to be full of joy. We want Christians to communicate that joy by word and deed to other Christians, which mm-hmm. we trust will also mean there will be um, um, sort of the spreading of that joy. So we're, our our prayer we're not being uh, you know petulant and saying uh, you know this specific version of my request isn't being met. We're we're right. we're praying for a gen, you know a general increase of the faith, which we we know that is what um, what God desires through through the revelation of holy right. scripture and, and the growth of the church on that so we're not i mean we're not angry at all we're not chastising people and wrapping people on the knuckles and saying why aren't you doing this that's not that's not that's not the point the point is for you and for me to look at ourselves first and to say is there joy in my life right um is is the fruit that i'm trusting the seed that's been planted is it bearing fruit and if it's not what what is happening um what what can I do? And you know, so it's just an example of just to, again to be transparent of how we look. We need to look at our as clergy we priests. We need to look at ourselves first before we start then um, diagnosing the congregation, if you will. Yeah. Take 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 the log out of your own eye before you start looking at splinters in others. Mm-hmm. So um, like this morning, I said, you know what? Um, I, it's been a little while since I've made my confessions. I made my appointment for Wednesday. Let's go ahead and get that. Let's have that spiritual checkup and, and Mm -hmm. unload those things and do those. Uh, and let's, let's look at my own attentiveness, attentiveness in prayer. Am I being distracted? Am I giving myself enough time to not be distracted? Am I doing other amplified devotions to supplement what I'm already doing. So if I feel a malaise or an anger or whatever going on, um, I need to check on that. How's my mental health? How's my physical health? Have I been to, have I been to my physician and, and, and all those things? So we do that first. And then we say, now, um, dear people of God, maybe it's good for all of us. Uh, not maybe it is good for all of us to do something similar. Mm-hmm. How is your spiritual health? What is happening? How is the whole the holistic approach to your life? Are are you are you taking care of it? And um, you know, if if our physical health is to eat right and exercise, our spiritual health certainly is to say our prayers, be present for communion, and um, um, and to and to realize our sins have been forgiven by the grace of Jesus Christ. We have been made new creations, and that means something. Yeah. And and that should look like something. Don't manufacture it, but but we should it should come naturally because it is it has um it has transformed us. Yeah, that's word, good news. Um, it is good news and the word I mean the way you just said it should come naturally. Um as we think about stewardship season and we're kind of preparing for that, the word that always comes to my mind during the season is compulsion. We should be compelled to to give not just to the church but to those in need and and that's kind of the the long term goal. Um, for most people, for most people, it's not a compulsion right now. But you try to build an a inward, habit. an inward, you know, compelling to do that. Yeah, not not the external saying we demand this from no, you. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And you try to build the habit now so that you don't even have to think about it. You your own spirituality compels you to do these good things from from the bottom of your heart. Um, it should be like that with. With ideally with all spiritual aspects. And I think maybe at our best days, there's one or two things that, you know, we're truly joyfully feel in, you know, a, a spiritual compo- compelling to do. But for a lot of it, it, it seems more like, um, you know, we're struggling to do it. But I think that's, that's the point. And you brought up the, the physical health metaphor. And that's, that's, everyone knows that everyone understands that intuitively, that there are some things that we do that we are happy to do to keep us healthy. And then there are other things, and it's probably different for every person where, you know, that's my, you know, downfall. That's my slippery slope. I know I can only have, you know, if I eat sweets at nighttime, it's going to become this whole thing. And so, you know, you have to kind of work through um, where are the hard areas and where do I need to focus more attention on. But the, but the goal is to, to have that inner compulsion. It's, a, it's second nature. Um, or it even becomes your, your first nature, uh, to use Paul's language of, you know, being renewed. Um, 
but we are compelled to do good things and to glorify God. And so I think that's, you know, kind of what, what you were getting at, what we're getting at of um, how do we get there? I mean, what's the next steps for us? Um, I was telling you uh, uh, about an hour ago that I went to the Wake Forest Clemson game yeah. on Saturday. And and I was telling you that we, um, my, my youngest and I, we left at halftime for, for a couple of reasons. One, we, we got there an hour early to watch to watch uh, all the warm-ups, and it was really interesting. And we've been sitting in there for over three hours, and yeah. the sun was was really, really bright. I'm, I'm a little burnt, and was, we weren't prepared for for the heat and the sun. So um, we, we checked out about halftime. And as we were walking out to the car, and um, we were given two tickets and a parking pass by a very generous parishioner. Thank you very much. And as we were walking through the, the, the parking lot, I noticed all of these, and this still just kind of intrigues me, all of these um, tailgating uh, setups throughout the parking lot, which is understandable before the game, you go in with friends and you and you you know grill out and have a good time, and then you go watch the game. Yet when I walked through, there were all these setups of people who never entered the stadium. They had their they had their setup with their televisions, and they were watching the game that was actually taking place about 300 yards away. So they were there for the fun and the fellowship part, but not actually present for the for the actual event. And I think the image that that, that sort of uh, stayed with me was I think there was a temptation for Christians to treat church that way, is that I want sort of the social element of it when, and frankly, I'm not sure churches provide, you know, the best, you know, the most engaging social opportunities yeah. like we used to, I think because of social media and sort of our mobility, we we kind of self-select our social engagement, you know, a bit differently now. But, but there's still some very exciting, fun things that we can do. But, but we, we we like that aspect of it. We like being with people, and we like maybe the trappings of it. But we never actually enter into where the event is, mm -hmm. of the of the thing that caused all the other gatherings to to begin with. Mm -hmm. And maybe something we can think about is, am I in the actual arena of faith? Or am I on the outside brought together by the the cultural trappings of it? And I'm enjoying that more than the actual substance that convened the people to begin with. And um I I, I think I think that's an interesting thing to ponder. Yeah. Getting getting close enough to, to taste the excitement, but not really going all in and getting the full thing. There's there's a lot there. Uh, let's transition to our next topic. Um, to be honest, we, we bantered about 15 different topics. I was with the young adults last night, and uh, they gave me a lot of suggestions. Um, which one did we did we ultimately decide on? What would you like to uh, talk briefly about next? Well, the first thing I'm thinking of is I've got to do this post on social media, is that since you have a birthday yeah. on um, on Saturday, you turn 30. I do. So we are having now to look for a uh, a new person to lead the young adult group because I think you've aged out. Yeah, I'm an old man now. So if you would my like back, to run the my young back adults, hurts when I wake up yeah, in the morning. Yeah, now it's, now it's all now Father Luke here. Father Luke will be uh, will be with the 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 elders now. Uh, and we're teasing, of course. Um, but happy happy early birthday anyway. Um, interestingly, speaking of saints, is your birthday is the nineteenth? Yeah. This is Which wild. is I, I've this told is the wild. story a bunch. Um, my parents, you know, Southern Baptists, loved the Bible, had no knowledge of the the sanctoral calendar, um, and I, I remind people of that because I was born October nineteenth, a day away from the feast of Saint Luke. My brother named Matthew was born on the feast of Saint Matthew, September twenty first. Totally coincidence. Parents did not even know it. I didn't even know it was a. It was. It, it had happened until I flipped through a book of common prayer for the first time in college and, you know, kind of said, oh, I wonder, wonder what, what my birthday's uh, saint is and was dumbfounded and then looked up the rest of my family and was even more dumbfounded. So yep. um, very, very interesting uh, to, for that to happen. But, but yes, um, that was, that was, it's always been a funny coincidence when it comes around. So the question the young adults or the issue they have raised is, Essentially, they had several versions of it, but my my guess is essentially the question is, what is what is the relationship between Christians and the saints, and yeah. and what do we what do we do with them, frankly? 
Yeah, is, I think several of them were asking about you know, maybe highlighting a, a specific saint, which I think will be beneficial. Maybe that's something we can do uh, or I can do with the young adults or we can do on here. And then others were asking about, um, you know, when we ask the saints to pray for us, like, what is happening? Um, how Basically, I think, how do we incorporate the lives of the saints and, and their prayers into our own spiritual life? I mean, what is that relationship? Um, because I think, and, and maybe this is where we can start, most people's first encounter with this is maybe uh, like their favorite sports player when they're a little kid. I mean, this is the relationship I'm going to use because I played baseball. I had you know posters of Texas Ranger baseball players on my wall when I was growing up, and it was almost like a, wow, look how good they are. That's the peak, and you know, a little encouragement to maybe work a little harder. Um, because look, these people are much better than I w I'll ever be. And I knew that, but kind of this, uh, you know, absent, I mean, a abstract sense of encouragement, like, you know, you can do it. And I think that's part of it, but I think it actually goes a lot deeper than that. So maybe that's where we can start. What, what role do they actually play in our lives today, here and now? Let's start by saying what they do not do. Sure. Is that saints are not the uh, instrument of salvation. Mm-hmm. Saints are not our saviors, as uh, even even as as amazing as they may be. Even mm -hmm. who, if we were to rank them, and we would certainly put the Virgin Mary at at the top, mm -hmm. she's not she is not our savior. So that's that's the most fundamental thing we must say uh, on the on the outset. Um, I think that uh, the other thing we need to say is what they what we do use them for is is um, is intercessory. Uh, intercessors in prayer uh, and um, instruments of encouragement mm -hmm. where we are inspired by their heroic faith and virtue. So while they're not the instrument of our salvation, they are instruments of inspiration mm -hmm. where we see them and we're motivated. And then we also recognize that in Jesus Christ, we are all in one body. Uh, we're all one body and um, we, we ask the saints who have now finished their journey on earth, and now we trust that they are, are um, near the throne of grace. Mm -hmm. They have the beatific vision. So remember us in that, in that moment. Pray for us. That does not um, mean that we must use them to get to Jesus. It's an act of fellowship. And oftentimes, where we, where we, where they, where they come in, come into play. Like, let's just, I'll just use myself as, as an example of, of sometimes when I will go and, and, um, sit before the shrine of St. Timothy. I've said this before, I think, on this podcast. I find Timothy an extraordinary inspiration to me personally because, um, he, and now, as I'm getting older, that, that, that relationship changes. But certainly when I became the rector of St. Timothy's, I was, I was your age. And I was really, really young, and that was not easy for me or for the congregation to have someone of my age to be to be the rector. They weren't prepared for that, really. And to uh, to rely on Timothy's experience. Remember, Saint Paul says, "Don't let anyone look down on you because you were young, but set the example for the believers in speech and purity and truth." Is to know there was someone in the faith who was a pastor, who was a young pastor, and 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 had struggles uh, for that reason to recognize you understand me in a unique way and I identify with you and I, f and I find in you a real spiritual friend. So someone I know who has the same experience can empathize with me. All I'm saying is I know you understand. So what I don't know how to articulate in my prayers, pray for me, mm -hmm. is you who understand and have finished this journey of faith um, um, just be with me, be, be, be a, a prayer warrior with me, just like you would. There really is no, no, um, psychological difference. There is a spiritual difference because of the level of sanctity, but maybe no practical or, or psychological difference of finding someone, um, who is alive, who's still in this yep. pilgrim of faith, pilgrimage of faith, that you trust to be a faithful person that has mm -hmm. some experience and some and some solicitude toward our context and and go to them and say will you just pray for me mm -hmm. we have we have no issue with that 
Um, yet for some reason th that gets confused. And I think I know why that gets confused when we, um, when we transition into the saints. And I think the difference is because I mean, imagine, imagine if, if you came to me, father Luke and say, will you please pray for me? I would say, go to Jesus yourself. To Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that would be, that would be, that would be, uh, cruel and, and, uh, unnecessary and, and, un and unscriptural. Yeah. So I think that, I think what, what people get hung up on is the word prayer to saints mm -hmm. and that, and that prayer is, is, um, is, is often used exclusively as a, as an act of adoration, which is mm -hmm. reserved for, uh, for, um, God alone. But, mm -hmm. but I think maybe we can go back and look at maybe some older language. And when you would request something from someone say, pray tell. Yes. Right. Is that, you know, prayer is, is a response. It's a longing of the heart and, and, and when we when we're praying to saints, we're sort of it's, it's a response. We're communicating, we're expressing, we're requesting, petitioning. and petitioning. And yes, uh, in our prayers to God, to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's an act of adoration that is reserved to God alone. Mm -hmm. But in prayers to the saints, it's much more. It's um, it, I mean, I think it's a, it's a much more sort of fluid sort of uh, response of just listen. I'm you know. Dear Saint Timothy, remember me, pray for me. Yeah. I'm not asking Timothy to save me, to forgive me. Right. Just pray for me. Just like yeah. I would asking you to pray for me as well. I mean, you, you brought, bring up uh Saint Timothy in, in Paul's letters to him and uh, I've been going through this book with the with the uh, youth right now and and he opens what chapter 2 I think when he gives the list I urge all of you with, you know, supplications, intercessions, prayers and thanksgivings um be made for all people. And, you know, prayer is one of the many forms that we uh, talk to God and talk to others. And, and he tells them, make intercessions on behalf of the people around you. You need to be praying for them and they need to be praying for you. I mean, we see this uh, throughout the New Testament, especially in Paul's letters. Uh, those who are sick, go visit them, go petition on their behalf. Um, and I, I also think that, you know, you bring up the... Um, hesitation or, or the comparison of somebody who's alive. We, we don't think twice about asking them to pray for us. So what about these people who have died? I also think it's, it's worth pointing out, um, and maybe you can help me clarify this some, that people will get uh, you know, stuck in, in, and maybe I've heard this as a Baptist growing up, that people will say, well, when the New Testament says saints, it really just means all believers. Um, it's the same word for Holy Spirit. It means holy ones, the ones who are set apart. And I think that's true. And then I think you can follow the logic and say, for those who have died, um, why would the church designate some as saints? It's because they have a very clear demonstration of a holy life. We don't presume uh, that anybody is necessarily with God, but we see lives that are clearly uh, holy, clearly set apart. Maybe uh, like in the early examples that in their last act on earth, it was a sacrifice to the Father as a martyr um, to offer their own lives. And so we, we recognize them as specifically set apart. Uh, I always tell people, like at the Feast of All Saints that is coming up, we don't know all the, all the quote-unquote saints who have lived. Um, there could be saints that you know didn't have a community to start their little sanctoral process, um, whatever it may be. And so this is not an exhaustive list. But these people that the church has designated as saints, uh, we can trust in. We can, we can say there's clearly evidence of a holy life. And so when we ask them to pray for us, it's asking someone that we can trust. It would be like asking, you know, that family member who you know is grounded and prays, and that's who you're going to go ask to pray for you. You're not going to ask, you know, your cousin who goes to church once a year. You're going to ask your grandma who, who knows her stuff and prays every single morning. And that is a similar idea with the saints. Those are the people we kind of go to first. Yeah, and listen, let's acknowledge that the reason why people have hang-ups about saints is because they have been used in super, with, um, with superstitious uh, intent. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people who will not go to church, who, yeah. who will just you know, pull out their back pocket to St. Anthony to find something they lost or, yep. or, or, or uh, you know, do not go to church or, or or participate in any religious activity will but will bury a statue of Saint Joseph upside down right. to sell a house. And then you have kind of what confirmation bias is that when that house is sold, they say, see it worked. Mm -hmm. And you know, there we are, or I found I found those keys that I lost. 
and people see that and they keep thinking, what kind of religion is this? This yeah. is this is this is sort of a pantheon of fairies who are just mm -hmm. you know granting you favors when you want them. But but let me just also say that in Holy Scripture, I was just pulling up uh, the book of Revelation as you were speaking yeah, yeah. and just two in two places quickly. And you mentioned that people say that saints in the Bible are, are those who are holy people. Well, not in the book of Revelation that's, yeah, that's where, you, where you, where you have the image of, of, of heaven. And like in verse five, where we see there, he had taken the scroll. This is, you know, the, um, um, the scroll has been taken and, uh, gosh, where am I? Uh, from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and with golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Hmm. And they sang a new song. Um, so um, there are two ways you could interpret that. You could say, are the people who are who are in heaven praying or are the people who are in heaven taking the prayers of those who are on earth taking their prayers mm -hmm. it's the same thing you have an intercessor who yeah, exactly. is who who is who is helping you and, and is an aid to you right. um on earth and then you go to um you go elsewhere into um into uh chapter 7 i think as well and you have something you have something similar so throughout all of of a revelation you have this image of of intercessors and and mm -hmm. and, this, and the prayers rising up but think about this if you're in heaven what are you praying for uh, you're, not you're not praying for yourself because for yourself, yeah. because you're in heaven. Yeah. So what else is prayer for other than praying for the people who are mm -hmm. on earth? And that makes you an intercessor yeah. if you're doing that, yeah. right? So that all we're doing is acknowledging what already happens according to Scripture right. and, of course, the early the early witness of the church. We're not trying to do anything anything else uh, and, and at it's all. It's also always, in any conversation about the saints, I'm also always... Um, both personally struck and convicted, but also, you know, feel the need to remind everyone we're all called to be saints. I mean, that Absolutely. is, that is yeah. the calling of the Christian. And so in a sense, saints and Christians are, are mirrored together. And yep. that does mean believers because that is all of our calling. Now, that well, does I mean, mean, yeah, does I mean, think about mean that right now you and I are saints. Absolutely not. But that is, that is the calling, kind of the standard uh, to which we are supposed to be modeling our lives and um in some you know examples we can we can see people meet that calling um as far as we can see in a in a very radical incredible way um and that becomes that source of inspiration for us we need to draw the distinction between um saint lowercase s which just go to the yeah. etymology of the word yeah. just means holy just yeah. means holy it's the same way description of the holy ghost right Correct. So if we, well, if we, if we were to, like, for instance, someone came to me and said they saw a, uh, a church dedicated to Saint Savior, mm. and they're like, oh, how can the Savior be made a saint? Yeah. The Savior, the Savior is the Savior. I said, no, no. I mean, yes, it's called Saint Savior, but it just means Holy Savior. Yeah. If you were to take, um, you know, the Latin Sanctus or or the Greek, you know, Agios. Agios, yeah. Like you know, in in the the great church in Istanbul, Constantinople, Hagia Sophia, is yeah. holy wisdom or mm -hmm. saint wisdom. It's the same thing. So, anyway, you've got you've got that lowercase s of holy, which we're called to all be saints in 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 that regard to be people of holiness. Then you have those people of heroic faith and virtue that the 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 body of Christ universal recognizes their holiness, mm -hmm. and that's what we would call saints with a capital S. Now the the formalization of that recognition it differs between jurisdiction right. the roman catholic church have their own process that the pope declares the orthodox church has a much more organic process of how that happens mm -hmm. uh the anglican communion has much more of a democratic process on that but it's the same it's the same thing uh is that do we recognize um heroic faith and virtue mm -hmm. and, and ultimately what's happening is do we have confidence they're actually in heaven to be interceding for us? I mean, that's 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 what's getting getting down to it. And um, you know, most of the saints that we rely on or that we incorporate in devotion and naming churches are those that predate any division within the church. So there's a universal recognition of faith and holiness, mm -hmm. like Saint Timothy. There's there's that's not a sectarian saint. Everyone acknowledges, you know, obviously Saint Timothy is being a saint 
along with St. Paul. So don't overthink it. It is. Um, and so I think someone asked maybe at young adult at the young adult group, how do I incorporate saints into my yeah, spiritual so life? Maybe, maybe this is another way to phrase it. What do they actually do for us? I mean, you, you go, you kneel before a statue of St. Timothy, and the statue is simply there to direct your mind to a statue. The statue does nothing. It's, yeah, it's the, inspiration. The statue is, yeah, is a, yeah it's, a, it's inspiration. I ask St. Timothy to pray for me. What happens? I mean, I think that's really where everyone kind of hits a wall, and they say, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Um, some people, you know, maybe you get a nice warm feeling inside, and they think, oh, he makes me feel better. But but what is what is really happening when we ask the saints to pray for us? Yeah, I would say one thing. I think, um, I don't think you were with us. You weren't with us then. Years ago, the youth group uh, was invited to do a tour of the of the local Hindu temple. I was there. And was one of you my were there. First, yeah, it was my, one of my yeah. first things I ever did. So it was interesting. Um, the The most interesting thing for me was actually hearing uh, very very kind people. They're very generous with their time and space. Is saying that they believe the deities actually inhabit the shrines Correct. that are there. And I thought that was interesting. And that was the immediate the distinction we made to our youth afterwards mm -hmm. is that our shrines do not the, the 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 saints do not inhabit the mm -hmm. the wood or the or the or whatever the material is. But when we look upon them. Um, our hearts and minds are elevated to where they actually are, which is in right. heaven, and not localized in the actual physical, sensible material. So I, I would think you have to think about the beauty of religion in terms of human psychology. Can I think about the witness of St. Timothy anywhere? Yes. Should I? Yes. Is it easier for me to be reminded of St. Timothy before an image of Timothy in the symbolism and the symbols of his life and his death? Absolutely. And so when I kneel before, um, I mean, I've, I've used this as an example before. I remember reading a long time ago uh, a, um, a article about how do you get better sleep at night? And one of the things that the article said was, it says, you, um, um, do an inventory of all the things that you do uh, in your bed that aren't uh, sleeping. Like, are you eating in bed? Are you yeah. Are you watching television? Are you reading a book? And the point it was making is, is that when you get in, in, in your bed, your body isn't actually sure what you right. want to have happen. And so if you only actually just sleep in your bed, the moment you do that, your, your body takes over and says, okay, it must be I'm time sleep, for sleeping. Yeah. The actual, the same sort of psychological principle happens in, in, in the religious life. Which is why our church here, we've we've worked very hard to make mm -hmm. sure it is unlike any other physical building you will enter, so that when you walk in, you can make that um, mental and emotional and spiritual transition from any other building to now this is a place of prayer. Yeah. So if I am before an image of a saint, um, then I can already I can switch faster to a mind of contemplation and a spirit of prayer. And um, and then you know what 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 do you do with them? Well, what's on your mind? What do you need? What, how how can their life um, give inspiration to mine? And so when I look upon that image of Timothy, and let's just say I'm struggling in my in my vocation as a as a priest and pastor, is that oftentimes what I hear echoing in that moment are actual words of Paul to Timothy. Yeah. I hear sort of scripture echoing in my mind. Is that piece of wood speaking to me? Well, not in the sense that it's a literal sense, but is 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 the is um, the example of Timothy speaking mm -hmm. to me, facilitated perhaps by the mm -hmm. senses, but what's really communicating to me, communicated to me, is the Word of God. Yeah, and then I think about what Paul said to Timothy, and I th mm -hmm. I'm, I'm reminded of 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 his life and his fidelity and his steadfastness. Mm -hmm. And that gives me comfort of, of knowing that you understand you've been there uh, and I trust that you uh, are remembering me before the throne of grace. Yeah. And then that, that also inspires me to go directly to the throne of grace, as we say in our prayers, to ask the Lord to, to be with me. So yeah. why not, why not, why not, why not um, incorporate everyone into our, into our journey? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's where the word devotion becomes really meaningful. I have a devotion to this particular saint. In the same way that if you have a loved one who dies, can you just sit and think about them and, and you know, feel connected to them? Sure. But what are you going to do? You're going to go find a picture. You're going to find a voice recording. You're going to find some tangible way of that might finally allow you to sit for a second and, and arrive at a space that you may have 
been able to get to by just, you know, standing outside. But that physical thing becomes the, the bridge to kind of get you into the right psychological space where something can happen, where you can feel that grief a little more deeply, where you can feel that love a little more deeply. And that's because you're devoted to that particular family member. The same thing happens with saints. The more you, you know, go to the shrine of St. Timothy and read Paul's letters to him, you, you develop that devotion, and then you actually can get something more out of it. I mean, it might be a helpful way to think about it. And what's also important to remember is that when you're going to a person who actually lived and had a life and a record is that you're not projecting what you want to be onto some blank yeah. canvas. And so what oftentimes what I hear reverberating back to me in prayer, like to Timothy, for instance, is chastisement, not, not in the sense that, that I'm being fussed at, but I remember his life. I remember Paul's words to him. And then I, I, I kind of hear what I need to hear. And that is, mm -hmm. Why don't you suck it up, Buttercup? You know what did you expect to happen in this life of ministry, uh, and and that's a that's a, that's a needed um, rebuke in that sense. And, and so what's what's helpful is when you're when you're next to their to their sanctity, and you recognize where you are lacking, then then that gives you some direction about how to go deeper into your faith and prayer, and not just some again nebulous blank canvas that I'm just going to make it all about me it's yeah. again it's, it's quite the opposite and that's that's another way to that is helpful so our, our, my encouragement would be is what is what saint what saint do you identify with either by life experience either by vocation um or or any other kind of element and then invite them to be a prayer partner with you and learn more about their lives and how they we're able to overcome the struggle of sin and the, you know, the world, the flesh and the devil. And how can they be a unique example to you? I mean, maybe a better way to or a different way to think about this is if you're an athlete, if you're a young um, middle school or high school athlete, let's just say you are a, a baseball player and um, you love playing baseball. Well, all athletes can give you inspiration. Caitlin Clark may be a great inspiration mm -hmm. for you, but you might resonate more with an actual baseball player who maybe plays the same position as who maybe plays the same position. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, and that may be, I mean, you can use them all, but you may actually find more in common with yeah. that one. So, so, so start with, with, with someone that you, you can really connect with in that, in that way. Yeah. That's what we naturally do in this life. So it's what Absolutely. we naturally do in our, in our prayer life as well with those who have gone before us. Yeah, that's good. Well, any more closing thoughts on uh, saints? If anybody, well, if, you, if you're listening to this and have a question, um, come and talk to us. We would love to, to chat about it, obviously. The, the closing thought is we have to say again and again and again, um, if saints rise to the level of superstition, it's, it's, it's moved outside of Christianity. Yeah. If the saints rise to the level of any kind of uh, co-redemptor or redemptor other than Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. then it's, it's moved outside the, the province of Christianity. But authentic Christianity from scripture and the early church tradition is simply recognizing that they have finished their race. They are um, recipients of the beatific vision. They care for us because they, they are in the love of God. And of course they, they care and love us and they are in whatever mystical way um, participating in our prayer through intercession. And that's all we're inviting and that's all we're asking for. Wonderful. Well, it's good to not be alone in this life. So Absolutely. Oh let my us gosh. always remember that. Let us close with the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.